Hello and welcome to Stretford Paddock. This is the one-on-one -on -one interview and I'm joined by football finance expert Kieran Maguire. I would go as far as to say friend of the channel at this point. How are you doing, Kieran? All, all good, Joe. All good. Uh, looking forward to the end of the season. Lots, uh, lots of exciting things uh, still ahead of us. So, uh, uh, And I guess as a United fan, it must be uh, even more tense uh, yeah. in terms of what's happening both on and off the field. I know, yeah, it's a, it's a quite the crescendo that we're sort of walking towards as United fans with the FA Cup final and obviously um, with the ownership stuff, obviously that's what you know, you're here to talk about and I want to quiz you and get every single detail lined up. First of all, the big question, when do you think we will know who the next owner of Manchester United will be? Well, if the reports are correct, the, the third and final round of bids mm. uh, expired last Friday night. And it does appear that there have been tweaks to the offers made by the, the two leading parties, which is Sir Jim Ratcliffe and, and Sheikh Jassim. So the, the Rain Group will go back, they'll advise and consult with the Glazer family. And on the back of that, um, we should, there's no reason why we can't hear anything in the next week or two. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like selling a house. If you've got two offers, you you, you add up the bits and pieces and, and you make mm. a decision on the back of that. Um, what we don't want is for the Glazers to try to nickel and dime the two bidders and say, well, yeah, how about a fourth round? Yeah, yeah because that, that it, it looks as if the, the money that they've been asking for the club, which is around about six billion, I, I don't think that that price has been met. Um, and yeah, the Glazers will do what's best for the Glazers, not what's best for Manchester United Football Club. Uh, and, and I think that would be the major reservation and concern I would have as a as somebody that's keeping an eye on what, what's taking place. Just on that, and I was going to get to that a little bit later, but obviously you, you've mentioned it there. Is do you think there is a chance that there could be a fourth round? Because obviously it was it was told that it was going to be this third and final round, but and maybe they never said second and final round. But I think when they announced the second round, people kind of assumed that might be the final round. Do you think there is a chance they go actually? we can maybe get another 100 million out of this. We can maybe get more assurances on X, Y, and Z going forward. Do you think this will be the final round or do you think there is still the door open for uh, maybe we could get a couple bit, you know, a couple more quid out of this? What do you reckon? In the world of business, never say never. Uh, mm. and, and, and we also know that to be the true in, in terms of football. Sometimes you think you've got a signing and, and then they disappear elsewhere and so on. Um, so if the two offers are extremely close then there's a case for saying look you know so jim's offered an extra 50 million yeah the 50 million just just can't can you just nudge it a little bit further higher yeah. um and if it's a case of it being so close that the that the deal is is going to be lost for a, yeah and, I, and it's, it sounds terrible for a few million quid then then you might consider um revising it again I think there's also, however, an interest from both of the potential bidders that they're fully aware that it's it's a big summer uh, about to approach mm -hmm. for Manchester United in terms of being in charge of the blood budget. Um, we saw what happened last year with Chelsea. Now the Chelsea deal went through, I think it was on the 31st of May, and, and then they were in a position to, to spend money. So the closer you get to the start of the transfer window, and once that transfer window does commence, you, you're then in, left in an awkward position if you're trying to sell the club, because yeah. it could be that Sheikh Jassim or Sir Jim Ratcliffe or whoever's going to be in charge has budget X, and the Glazers have approved budget Y. And, and if the two numbers don't agree, you either end up signing too many players, too few players, or the wrong players. It mm. could be that the new owners have uh, their, their own data consultants. They've, they've done their own uh, money ball analysis of Manchester United, and, and they want to, to have a different strategy and culture when it comes to player recruitment. That could be a real mess if, if we enter the, the, the mm. summer 23 transfer market. So that's why I think it's, it it's benefits both parties for, for the deal to be A, decided and then completed um, as soon as possible. There's this interesting dynamic at the moment. I'll get back to transfers in a minute because I want to go into that a little bit more and some of the reports that have come out in the last sort of 24 hours. But it seemed as though for the first couple of rounds of bidding, and maybe this was just the sort of me as a, you know, the general public's assumption that because Sheikh Jassim has access to my money, therefore his bid would be bigger. 
And then there was this, then uh, that, they seemed to, that seemed to be confirmed with this sort of 4.6 to 4.3 billion bid that was, you know, these sort of rumors in favor of Jessim over um, Jim Ratcliffe's bid. Then the last round of bid in, there seems to have been this like new idea that Jim Ratcliffe could come in and keep the, 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 the Glazers in in some um, respects. This is uh, from the Telegraph here saying that um, um, Ineos want to purchase the Glazers 69% shareholding, but are also uh, understood to have made a proposal that would see them take a controlling stake, but allow Joel and Avram uh, to remain as minority shareholders. Now, there's a couple of questions I want to get to off the back of that. One is, how is it also being said in the same article that Ineos are the only bidder to have valued the club above five billion, and that their proposal, uh, pr uh, proposal equates to more than the offer presented by Qatar. How can Jim Ratcliffe's offer be bigger, yet only be buying 69% when Sheikh Jassim's offer is smaller, but he claims to want 100%? How can those two things be true? And secondly, you did a tweet or a series of tweets a couple of weeks ago about how there could be a scenario where these Class A and Class B shares that are owned by the Glazers, the Class B shares that are worth more voting rights, they could own a, mi a tiny minority of the club, yet still have voting control of the club. How do all of those things, and it's a big question there, how do all of those things work? And do you see a way where Jim Ratcliffe owns 69% or whatever it would be, yet somehow the Glazers are still in charge? Surely he wouldn't want that. Yeah, I, th I think we need to, to separate those two issues. Okay. In respect of the, the different bids, Jim Ratcliffe might value Manchester United overall at just over £5 billion. But if he buys just enough shares to gain control, it's only going to cost him 51% of £5 billion. Okay. So therefore, from his point of view, he says, actually, yeah. it's costing me £2.5 billion or £2.6 billion or whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, Sheikh Jassim is trying, by all accounts, to, to buy all of the shares. So that's the shares both owned by the Glazer family and the shares which are being traded on the New York Stock Exchange and effectively take the club private. And we've seen that happen before with Manchester United. It was listed on the London Stock Exchange. Then it went private. Then it was uh, relisted, uh, as, but this time on New York. So th that's how we would square that. You know, It could be that Sheikh mm -hmm. Jassim values it at 48 Everybody gets to make some money on the back of that. Whereas with the, the Sir Jim deal, what he could do is to organise it in such a way that um, the Glazers or some of the Glazers agree to sell him their shares. And those shares are still classified as Class B shares and carry the additional voting rights. Now, if you take a look at the small print of Manchester United's constitution and hands up, look, I'm not a lawyer, but it does appear to give the Glazers um, a bit of latitude as to what they can do. In Normally, when the Glazers sell shares, they automatically convert to the, the one share, one vote, Class A shares. But there is in the small print, it says, at their discretion, in effect, or this is how it could be interpreted, at their discretion, it could say, we're going to give Sir Jim some of the shares which are worth uh, 10, 10 votes each. You do the sums, he ends up with 51% of the votes. Joel and Avram end up with, say, 20% of the votes. Kevin and Darcy and whoever else, eh, 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 you know, they, they exit stage left. Right. Um, and the other shareholders, the, the shareholders who currently have their shares on the New York Stock Exchange, they're still left with their shares as before. And I think if that is the case, um, I, I, the share price would fall potentially because a lot of people have bought into Manchester United shares on the back of being able to sell them at a significant profit. At a, at a, at a price of around about five billion for all of the shares, that values the shares at around about $32 each. Now they're currently trading at 20, which would indicate mm. that the market's getting cold feet as to whether a, a full sale is going to go through. So just again, speaking as, as a, a layman here who just wants it broken down into a nice sort of bite-sized bowl of cereal for me. If, if Jim Ratcliffe came in, obviously you don't, you know, you're not sat in the room with them while these conversations are taking place, but do you imagine a situation where he would be okay with spending all of this money and leaving the Glazers in charge? Or do you think he would insist that if I'm going to be spending, you know, what you, what you said, two and a half billion, 
I need full control of this club. Do you think he would work in, in tandem with, or do you think you know a man of his stature, a man of his age as well? You've mentioned that in the past. He wants this you know final part of his of his career to be one that has a bit more of a legacy to it. Um, do you think he's going to come in and, and share control with the Glazers, or do you think he would want that fifty one percent and therefore basically full control of the club? There's no way that Sir Jim would accept being a minority shareholder in terms of votes, in my opinion. Um, because as you rightly say, why? what's in it for him? Uh, mm. if, if you take a look at what happened at Arsenal, where um, uh, Usmanov had around about 35% of the club, Stan Kroenke had the other 65% and wouldn't give him a place on the board and, and wouldn't allow him involved in, certain, in terms of decision making. What's what? What's the benefit for Sir Jim Ratcliffe in having a similar scenario? You know, he he is an incredibly wealthy individual, mm. but there's there's no there's no gain from his point of view. I think he wants to go down as the man that saved Manchester United, the man that turned Manchester United around after the Glazer ownership, and for that to be the case, he has to have control in terms of boardroom decisions and and things such as you know strategy both on and off the pitch because yeah we i've, I've had that discussion with you and jay and, and many other mm. people before uh old trafford is it's not a 21st century stadium and, it, and it's not fit for manchester united fans yeah um i just it, it's all very odd isn't it do you think obviously we saw the protests uh, the other day there's been protests for close to 20 years now um before and ever since the glazers took over man united fans do not like the glazers that is a well-trodden, well-understood sort of part of, of United's kind of recent history. Do, surely Jim Ratcliffe knows that. What, why would he be willing to keep them, maybe they're not involved in the decision-making, um, but keep them involved in the club? Is it, is it he doesn't have quite enough money to buy the entire thing? Is it that he wants to you know, keep his options open? Why do you think he would be up for doing that? Because I know that, obviously, I think a lot of Man United fans or, or, you know, I'm not going to speak for United fans, but there will certainly be some people, maybe a lot of people, who think if the Glazers are involved in any way, then this takeover isn't a success, or certainly isn't the success it could have been. Obviously, I think we can all understand if they don't have any voting rights, they don't have any control whatsoever, that isn't as bad as it is now. But surely Jim Ratcliffe sits there and thinks, the fans aren't going to love this. If the Glazers are still involved, if they're still even minority shareholders... People are going to go. Well, Sheikh Jassim would have got rid of them. We don't like this. Does it, do you think? What do you think he's making of all that? Why do you think he's willing to keep them on if he, you know, if the reports are true? I think there's two elements to that. Ultimately, the Glazers are in a very strong negotiating position because they don't have to sell. They could right. keep hold of their shares in Manchester United. They could uh, return to a position where they're picking up £18 million pounds a year in dividends and selling off small tranches of shares. And that's going to bring them tens of millions on an annual basis should they decide to go down that particular route. So they, they don't have to give up control. So therefore, if we've got four of the Glazer siblings who are looking for an exit route and, and we've got the two who want to stay, so Jim might, you know, he's, he's a pragmatist you know he's he's used to the ways of boardrooms and he will take the view that if, as he's got control of the board of directors yes you've got a duty to you know a responsibility to listen to other voices but it's a bit like me in a conversation with my wife you know we we, we in theory we we equal partners and we have a discussion and then then we do whatever she tells me to and and and, and that's that's and the that's case quite here. right oh yeah yeah i'm, I'm not i'm not <laughs> Yeah, she's in the other room. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not going to argue with that. So having a voice is one thing. Having control is another. And if the Glazers' responsibility, I can understand it from an emotional point of view. Why Manchester United fans would be unhappy with that mm. situation. But I'll be honest. If they're not directive, if they, if they if they've not got their hands on the steering wheel, they're effectively passengers in the car. Then. I'd, I'd, I'd certainly take that. It, it, it would it would bug me a mm. bit, but th yeah. they're not going to be uh, determining the key decisions that, that occur in the club in terms of setting the transfer budget, setting the infrastructure budget, uh, recruitment and retention, you know, all, all of the key things which I think are, are, are important to the hearts of Manchester United mm. fans. At the same time, I can understand if, if, I, if I was a fan, the toxic relationship that's existed since 2005 
you know, it, it's a bit, yeah. Divorces, divorces are messy. Um, divorces, when you've got no need to have any contact with with the former party, are actually a lot easier to deal with. But if you've got to share some you know, bits and pieces, then uh, it, it, it's it's not ideal. So so that's that's where we are. You know, I, I think that the two glazers that want to stay on genuinely believe that they can open this magic box and Manchester United is actually worth 10 billion pounds and they want to be part of that because if we can convert all of the Manchester United fan base into paying a pound a year yeah presently the glazers are getting or not glazers Manchester United are generating 53 pence per fan per year if these stories of 1.1 billion followers are true um mm. you've only got to double that to yeah you know, and a pound per fan per year and, and that's taking advantage of the digital world in which we're now in all of a sudden the business is transformed and i think that's where they have both seen historically with Super League and Project Big Picture mm. and see going forwards uh, increased wealth from the club. Yeah, I think, to me, I think having the Glazers with no control of the club whatsoever is certainly better than the situation we're in now, just not as good as the one I had in my head at the start of this. Do you know what I mean? I think it's that kind of, it's, it is a compromise, isn't it? It's, it's you know, because I think there's two things and we've spoken about one, but I think Two things that have really bugged United fans, I'll speak for myself again, bugged me about the Glazers is, first of all, the decision making, which you would lose if they were no longer uh, a majority shareholder. The people they've hired, Ed Woodward, the, the sort of, the people, money people put in charge of football and decisions because they were friends with the Glazers. That has been a disaster for Man United on the pitch. Oh. Also, the debt. That's the second thing. The fact that they bought Man United with someone else's money and never paid it back and only further grew that debt over the last 15 years is a, a huge issue for Man United. And in, and in replacement for um, uh, you know, upgrading the training ground, upgrading the, the Old Trafford, as you mentioned there, upgrading facilities, um, upgrading the area around Old Trafford, um, they have basically paid money onto that debt. That has been a huge issue for Man United fans. Sheikh Jassim has publicly, or I say publicly, through the media, declared that there would be no debt with his bid. We haven't quite had the same assurances with Radcliffe, or there have been suggestions of it, and then other people saying there hasn't. How do you see that working? Because not just do you think the debt will go, but will there be money available for you know, a revamp or a new Old Trafford, revamps to Carrington or a new training ground? Like, What do you see after this? If, 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 if Jim Radcliffe, who seems to be leading the way at the moment, comes in, where what what other money will be available, and will there be a, a debt-free Manchester United going forward? I think, in terms of the debt, uh, if, if anybody's familiar with sort of Islamic finance, the concept of debt and interest it is not part of, of the way that uh, the sort of the banking system works there. So Sheikh Jassim, I think, will be looking to repay the third-party debt. Um, debt in itself is is not a problem, so long as something sensible is done with it. So. For example, Spurs have got this mm. huge amounts of debt, but they've also got a, a, a brand spanking new stadium. I don't know whether you've been there, but I've, I've been there as an away fan. And it's not often that you walk in somewhere and, and, and your jaw drops. You know, it, is, okay. it is fantastic. Um, you know, what, what you see on the pitch isn't necessarily as good, but that, that's a separate issue, of course. Um, and, and it also, it's geared towards, and, and you know, th this is the downside. You get brand spanking new stadium, that then the, then the club's going to try to to empty the pockets of everybody that turns up, and that that includes yeah. the hardcore United fans. You know, I've, I've lived in Wally Range, I've, I've lived in Didsbury, you know, East Didsbury and Burnage and places like that um, when I was younger, um, and I, I know sort of hardcore United fans, and I used to play for. Uh, for, for Trafford Cricket Club as well, so mm. I, I, know, I know what the Manchester, what I would call the Manchester United fan base is, in terms of, of hardcore. And then, yeah. you know, we, we have we have seen the gentrification of the game arise in, you know, in, in the last few decades. And I appreciate you know that, that everybody's entitled to go to the game, um, and and will have different views. Those fans, I would be concerned about because those fans, I think, in a new stadium, potentially could be priced out of of supporting Manchester United, which I think would be. A scandal and a tragedy yeah. for the club. Um, in in terms of Sir Jim's approach, it, it depends which newspaper you, you read, because mm. what we are seeing is an awful lot of leaking from the press agencies who are working on behalf of the 
for two bidders. Some people have got Sir Jim you know, with his nose in the front. Other people have got uh, Jasim, who's just nudging ahead and uh, and so on. Um, and I, I don't think we can draw too many conclusions because it depends which journalist you're speaking to, and it's 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 depending on who's who's built up a relationship with, with with the different parties. Um, I think Sir Jim's approach it's more likely to 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 carry on with the debt. There has been some talk about some uh, quasi debt uh, to be added on uh, in order to fund uh, the the infrastructure costs at the stadium and and Carrington and so on, which which have fallen behind the times. Um, especially in recent years, as far as the Glazers' ownership is concerned. And the reason for that is, is under both the, the European Super League and the Project Big Picture uh, schemes, that there was going to be a central fund which would effectively have given grants to, to the clubs to, to allow them to, to build up their stadiums. Um, so uh, it looks as if Sir Jim's position is that he, if he has to go and repay that debt on top of buying enough shares to get 51%, that might be from a cash flow point of view where he doesn't want to go the interest on the debt actually is quite low these days we we no longer have got those we've no longer got those payment in kind notes where manchester united were paying 14.25 percent and sometimes 16.25 percent um interest it's it's now you know a less than yes yeah, around about three to four percent on average uh in terms of the loan notes that's i, I understand the irritation from fans and also the fact that you know, 917 million pounds um, in interest payments is is painful um, yeah. from because it's symbolic because it's associated with the glazers. I absolutely understand that, but I, I don't think the debt is a huge issue as far as the club is going is concerned going forwards. I, I would be more concerned if there's going to be additional debt taken on by one of the parties, and that's more likely to be the Ineos speed and Sir Jim Ratcliffe than it is uh, with, with Jasine. Um, just finally, a um, couple, of, couple of things. Firstly, do you, who do you think, just from what you've read, what you've seen, how the numbers add up in, in your view, who do you think will be the next owner of Manchester United? Um, and, and secondly, do you think that um, if, if it were to be Jim Ratcliffe, because I think, uh, we've spoken more about Jim Ratcliffe because it seems as though there's more kind of nuances and more things that don't make sense to someone like me who isn't a money person. This seems like more of a business deal, the way Ratcliffe is doing it. The way Sheikh Jassim doing it seems to be more of a purchase. You know, he's just buying what's there in front of him. I'll take it. Yes, please. I'm happy with that. Ratcliffe is, is sort of fiddling with the kind of, you know, he, he's acting like a businessman rather than just a wealthy bloke. So... Which one seems more likely is my question. Who do you think, with everything that we've seen and assuming that what the reports are saying are true, how do you think this shakes out, if it, just your opinion? I, I would go 60-40 in, in favour of Sir Jim Ratcliffe, um, mainly because the, the Glazers that want to stay get their wish. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if Sheikh Jassim does go for it, uh, I think it will be a... A different Manchester United, and, and and I don't know what the reaction of Manchester United fans will be because clearly that there there have been some issues with with regards to Middle East ownership. Though if, if you talk, you know, you 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 live in the city, you speak to city fans. Uh, I know plenty of Newcastle fans. They they've got no complaints with the owners. I, I think other people have. Um, I think some of again perhaps some of the old school Reds who are you know uh, as politically. Uh, invested in the club as, as they are emotionally on the football side of things, they might have some reservations as well. But my, my gut reaction is that I, I think Sir Jim will, has probably got a slightly better chance. And, and then there's then there's the elephant in the room. What happens if the Glazers decide to go for neither and instead take on one of the minority shares from you know, the likes of Elliott Group and so on and, and use that money to, to fund expansion? Mm. I think that would be worse, certainly worst case scenario by a long, long way as far as Manchester yeah. United fans are concerned. Yeah, I think that would be a disaster for Manchester United and for um, the Glazers, to be honest. I, I, I think, I know people talk about them living in Florida, keep, you know, burying their heads and not, not paying attention to the negativity, but I think even they must know that that would be a, 
you know, a disaster in terms of protests and uh, and response from United fans after what we saw last season from the um, the Super League. I think you could, you know, ramp that up multiple times. Um, thank you, Kieran, for coming on, breaking down some of what to me felt like confusing uh, lingo and jargon around these bids, but you've you've completely uh, broken it down, and I, I feel like I understand it. Um, well, not every single piece of it, but certainly all the bits that I wanted to understand. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks very much for the invite and uh, best wishes for the rest of the season. Thank you and very much. And hopefully a season that we find out who will own Manchester United. And as you said there, Kieran, potentially in the next couple of weeks. Um, right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. This has been the one-to-one -one interview with football finance expert Kieran Maguire. Hit subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you in a bit.